Thank you very much. And let me add my own thanks to the organizers uh, that made this event possible. Clearly, entrepreneurship and innovation are alive and well here at Asade. So I want to discuss with you some research I'm doing about how companies are innovating in economies where services are becoming a larger and larger portion of the economic activity. And as I have dug into this work, I've come to the belief that companies, whether they make products or services, need to rethink their business to think of themselves as a service business. And that, let me explain to you why. This continues some work that started some years ago with my first book, Open Innovation, that discussed new ways that industrial research and development was changing to a more open process, many more contributions from the outside coming into innovating organizations, and many more pathways for the ideas in these organizations to go out to the market. The second book was about opening up the business models that companies use to both create value and capture a piece of that value in their own business. And this book that I want to share with you today carries this work now into the services realm. A problem that really got me interested in this came from a very important person at a very large company, IBM. And this person was in charge of 3,000 researchers all around the world. Lots and lots of master's degree, PhDs, uh, studying new technologies, new products. But this person, Paul Horn, had a real problem. And his problem was, half of the company's business that was paying for these 3,000 researchers was coming from services, not from products. And all of those 3,000 people were working on great new product ideas, new technologies, but not contributing anything to the services, which was now half of the company's business. This became his problem. And I've come to believe that it's not the same thing to innovate products and technologies when you're thinking about innovating in services. Let me explain why. A very powerful concept that has really anchored a lot of our understanding about innovation in products and technologies hails from Michael Porter, very famous Harvard professor who really wrote the book on competitive strategy. This is a figure from his 1985 book called Competitive Advantage. And the argument he makes here is this is how companies add value in the value chain. Ideas, technologies go from the inbound logistics through the operating processes out into the marketplace and some overhead functions support these activities. And we get margin at the end of this process and oh yeah, there's this little wedge for services. In this conception, services is the last thing you do before the product goes out the door. And I used to work for a company like this, and I was responsible in part in my job for services. And we looked at services as something that would keep the product from coming back to us. So we would ship the product, uh, we would give whatever support to install the product that was necessary, and then we would walk away. So the way you gained competitive advantage was with better products, lower costs, higher quality. Uh, but I think in the world that we're moving into today with companies like IBM, where more and more of their revenue is coming not from products, but from services, in economies where more and more of our economic activity is coming not from agriculture, not from manufacturing, but from services, we need to think differently. And here's another way to think about your business. At the center of what you do is the customer's experience. And then you create a series of activities inside your own organization to engage with that customer, potentially to co-create with that customer. And there are a series of activities outside the boundaries of your firm that are also a very important part of how you work with your customers. I am not unique 
in making this point. Indeed, people who were writing at the same time Michael Porter was were also making the same point. Uh, Peter Drucker, who is celebrated upstairs in the history at Asade, in the history of management thinking, made the point that when people buy a product, they don't buy it for the product itself. They buy it for the utility of that product, what the product does for them. Another professor at Harvard in the marketing organization, Ted Levitt said, people buy quarter inch drills because they want quarter inch holes, not because they want the drill itself. It's just the means to the end, the utility, the experience. If you think about transportation, you can see this as well. Most of us own a car, which means we own 100% of the costs of maintaining that car, of fueling the car, servicing it, garaging it, all the rest of those expenses. But most of us only use the car a small percentage of the time. Well, car companies are beginning to experiment with new services, like the Zip Car, which is a pretty well-known one, and a less well-known experiment shown here with Daimler called car to go This is an all-electric vehicle with a GPS inside the vehicle. So you can look on the web, see where the car is located, go to that place, get in the car and drive it with no security deposit, no upfront commitment, no monthly minimum, very flexible, very convenient. And when you're done driving, you simply go leave the car somewhere in the city. The GPS knows where the car is, so if the car needs to be refueled or serviced, they can find the car and you're done. So it's the same physical item, a vehicle, but now it's wrapped in a completely different business model, which is a service. UPS is also doing this. Uh, in the past, they've been a package delivery company competing with DHL, FedEx, or the National Postal Service. Well, they still do that business, but UPS today offers their customers another opportunity. Let us become your shipping department. And by becoming the shipping department at these customers, UPS now sees into the customer's processes in ways they could not see before when they were on the outside competing to ship some of those parcels. And because of this new understanding of the customer's processes, UPS can now help them with things like supply chain logistics that they were not able to even understand before because they had no visibility into the problems of those customers. I would be remiss if we didn't talk about some examples here from Catalonia. Uh, and of course, a favorite one amongst all of you here, I'm sure, is the El Bulli restaurant uh, from Ferran Adria. And of course, it's a marvelous restaurant with, with world-class cuisine. But it's also a very interesting example of service innovation. The basic idea that led to these kinds of foams comes from molecular gastronomy. And this was a, a concept developed by a French physical chemist named Hervé Thys. And Adria, working with Thys, commercialized this in his restaurants. And because of the success of El Bulli in the restaurant in bringing this new kind of cuisine uh, to uh, all of us, really, a number of organizations are working with El Bulli now on partnerships in areas like coffee or oils and foods and snacks or airlines or hotels, areas that most restaurants have no dealings with at all. But in the El Bulli world, they have partnerships. Mm -hmm. And so the El Bulli activities now span well beyond a traditional restaurant. Uh, here's my last example for you from another business. In this business, semiconductors, manufacturing itself has become a service. In the old days, you had to actually make a computer system to make the memory in that system. In the 1960s, companies like Intel, National, Motorola, Signetics, and others arose that could create separate memory chips for large systems. More recently, in the 1980s, the new innovation came into practice by, by a company in Taiwan, probably the most important company in Taiwan 
that most of us have never heard of, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, TSMC. And in the TSMC model, a company designs a chip but does not have to build the factory to make the chip. They can take their design and give it to TSMC who builds that chip in their factory. And each of those chip design companies rents capacity to manufacture from TSMC as a service. So they don't have to pay for an entire factory. They only pay for the capacity they use in the factory. Most recently, TSMC has raised the bar yet again, now with what they call their open innovation platform. And this is an offering where they aggregate all the external intellectual property for chip design and chip manufacture, both from TSMC and from other companies. And they test all of this together to make sure that it works. And with all those tested and validated choices, customers that use the open innovation platform are guaranteed that their chips will work the first time through the manufacturing process. So the TSMC customers get peace of mind and faster time to market by using TSMC's service, aggregating these third parties in a very open way in comparison to more traditional manufacturing foundries where they can make the chip but you have to get these designs on your own. It's also interesting to think about where TSMC sits geographically. They're right across the Straits of Taiwan from the rest of China. And there's a lot of new semiconductor factory capacity being built in China right now because capacity uh, is uh, growing, the capital cost in China is cheaper than in many other places, and they're really intensifying the global competition in this industry and indeed in many others. So how is TSMC going to fight back and differentiate themselves? By using services, services like the open innovation platform. So these are some of the ideas uh, in the book Open Services Innovation, and I have four suggestions for you for what you do coming out of this talk. The first suggestion is to think about how important services is in your business. And if it's not very important today, elevate the importance. Think of organizations like TSMC that are differentiating against tough competition through their services. The second thought is to look at what your customers are really buying, whether you sell a product or a service, and find ways to enhance the value of what you are selling to them. The third suggestion is, like the automotive example, look for assets where you don't have to pay 100% of the costs because you can utilize them with others in more open ways to spread those costs over more transactions, more people, and that makes it cheaper for everybody. And then lastly, you want to create a platform that's going to connect the products and services, whether made by you or by others, together into systems and solutions that delight your customers. If we can do that, I think we can achieve sustainable competitive advantage in the 21st century by linking services and products together. Thank you very much.